Hello and welcome to this first look exploring session looking at Volpone by Ben Johnson or The Fox. Um, uh, uh, premiering uh, between uh, either 1605 or 1606 uh, by the King's Men uh, at the Globe, probably. And uh, yeah, it's... Uh, Second Ben Johnson in 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 in, in a row for us. Uh, we did some Ben Johnson last week. We're doing some more Ben Johnson, different tone, uh, slightly. Um, uh, it's a text most people will know, so we're we're not going to hang around on it too much because uh, there's a lot of data in the world about Volpone. There are books, uh, there are articles, there's a lot of stuff. So we're just going to sort of crack on. And reading uh, Volpone today is Aliki Chapel, who actually doesn't know the play at all. So this should be fun. Excellent. Um, uh, those who do know the play, hold off, hold off on your uh, foreknowledge and take it as it comes. Uh, reading Mosca today is... Sarah Blake, very happy to be reading Mosca today. Uh, reading uh, Sir Politic, Voltore, um, uh, the prologue and Corvino is... Alan, in Suffolk, already confused. Uh, reading the acrostic, and you don't get them very often, um, as well as Nano, uh, Carbaccio, and Peregrine is. Hi, I'm Lynn. I'm living in the northwestern United States, accompanied by my puppy. Um, yeah, hi. And I'm your host, Robert Crichton. I will be reading a few minor characters, but mostly stage directions, um, and just generally keeping the thing moving along. Uh, just a note uh, for the readers as well. I may slightly change some of the stage directions as we go along. So, so you know, there, there'll be a gap where the stage direction lives. I may say something slightly different because uh, most of them are inferred stage directions that are not necessarily textually uh, authoritative. So uh, I may vary what you've got in front of you. Um, and of course, for the uh, listener at home, uh, or viewer at home, uh, that there, there may be some variations there. Um, so, uh, at the beginning of the text, I mean, this is not really theatrical. I don't think they 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 put this up anywhere. Um, but there is uh, there is the argument which is laid out as an acrostic. So we have uh, beginning with a V and an O and an L and a P and an O and an N and an E. Uh, we have uh, this little outline of uh, of what's going on. And so to uh, read the acrostic, the argument, uh, I'll pass over to Lynn. The argument. Volpone, childless, rich, feigns sick, despairs, offers his state to hopes of several heirs, lies languishing, his parasite receives, presence of all, assures, deludes, then weaves other cross plots, which ope themselves, are told. New tricks for safety are sought, they thrive when bold. Each attempts the other again, and all are sold. And I throw that in because I have actually seen that performed uh, in live productions. <laughs> you know, they're fun little things, and it vaguely gives you an outline what's going on um, of, uh, of, of of the play. But uh, let's get to some actual theatrical material. Uh, Alan, take it away with the prologue, please. Now luck yet sends us, and a little wit will serve to make our play hit. According to the palates of the season, here is rhyme, not empty of reason. This we were bid to credit from our poet, whose true scope, if you would know it, in all his poems still hath been this measure, to mix profit with your pleasure. And not as some whose throats their envy failing cry hoarsely. All he writes is railing. When his plays come forth, think they can flout him, with saying he was a year about him. To this there needs no lie, but this his creature, which was two months since no feature, and though he dares give them five lives to mend it, tis known five weeks fully penned it, from his own hand, without a coadjutor, novice journeyman or tutor. Yet thus much I can give you as a token of his play's worth. No eggs are broken, nor quaking custards with fierce teeth affrighted, wherewith your light are so delighted. Nor hails he in a gull old ends reciting to shot stop gaps in his loose writing, with such a deal of monstrous and forced action as might make Bethlehem a faction. 
nor made he his play to jest stolen from each table, but makes jest to fit his fable, and so presents quick comedy refined, as best critics have designed the laws of time, place, persons he observeth, for no needful rule he swerveth. All gall and copperas from his e he draineth, only a little salt remaineth, wherewith he'll rub your cheeks till red with laughter. They shall look fresh a week after. And yeah, so a briefly pause on that. Some nice things in there. Um, and again, it's very much Ben Johnson talking to his critics here. Going, you know, I'm not sure who the critics are. I don't. Know, I don't think the audiences are sitting there going, Ben Johnson. It takes ages to write a play. I, okay. I, I, I don't think the audiences are are aware of how how quickly or how slowly it takes him to turn a play around. I mean, it did take him an awful long time to write Sejanus in uh, in in genuine terms. Uh, there was quite a gap between. Uh, or at least as far as we know, between his uh, his previous play and, and that. Um, and uh, maybe there's some cl complaint amongst the community that he is slow to write. Um, uh, and yeah, and just in terms of his question of tone and things, I don't know how theatrical this prologue was or whether it's, again, uh, something that's more added for the print uh, or, or who. I, I, I'm interested in that. But it's it's a... I don't know if it has much relevance to an audience today as a prologue. I think the across that's probably why people use the acrostic because it's more useful as a prologue than this is. But uh, <laughs> Lynn, Lynn is not so keen on the biographical nature of Ben Johnson's life, are you? <laughs> oh, I'm actually I am kind of keen on it, but um, I, uh, I you know I I'm a great believer in engaging with a text on its own, and I'm not a fan of biographical criticism, but. Johnson was a character. If you're interested in biography as biography, he had a personality. Uh, you know, he wanted us to know what what to think of him uh, more than any other writer in this period. Um, he seemed to be concerned about what people thought. Mm. Uh, um, I mean, we know nothing about Middleton, basically. You know, we don't know very much about... Uh, Oh, what's his name? Who's always breaking my heart? That one. Um, I mean, yeah. Well, we um, know a bit about him. We certainly know about his, his, his... We probably know more about his mother than we do about him. <laughs> yeah, that's the way to yeah. put it, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, there, there is a biographical reason to get out of uh, Middleton. Uh, but it's yeah. mostly but to do with... Almost nobody else told you how to read his work. Mm. It's like, I'm busy. I got to write this play. I was like, I'm only getting five pounds for this. I, you know, I... I... Mm. Right. Well, uh, uh, having having put the prologue to one side, let's get into the action. And we're going to read a reasonably chunky amount of text before we pause again. Uh, we're going to let uh, the characters shine. So Act 1, Scene 1. We're relatively maximalist on the uh, the kinds of scene numbers that we've got here. Um, and uh, it's Enter Volpone and Mosca. Good morning to the day. And next, my gold Open the shrine that I may see my saint. And uh, there is Mosca reveals the gold. Hail the world's soul and mine. More glad than is the teeming earth to see the longed for sun peep through the horns of the celestial ram am I to view thy splendor darkening his that lying here amongst my other hordes showest like a flame by night. Or like the day struck out of chaos when all darkness fled unto the center. O oh, thou son of soul, but brighter than thy father, let me kiss with adoration thee and every relic of sacred treasure in this blessed room. Well did wise poets by thy glorious name title that age which they would have the best thou being the best of things, and far transcending all style of joy in children, parents, friends, or any other waking dream on earth. Thy looks, when they to Venus did ascribe, they should have given her 20,000 cupids. Such are thy beauties and our loves. Dear saint, Riches, the dumb God that gives all men tongues, that canst do naught, and yet makes men do all things, the price of souls, even hell, 
with thee to boot is made worth heaven. Thou art virtue, fame, honor, and all things else. Who can get thee? He shall be noble, valiant, honest, wise. What he will, sir. Riches are in fortune a greater good than wisdom is in nature. True, my beloved Mosca. Yet I glory more in the cunning purchase of my wealth than in the glad possession. Since I gain no common way, I use no trade, no venture. I wound no earth with plowshares, fat no beasts to feed the shambles, have no mills for iron, oil, corn, or men to grind them into powder. I blow no subtle glass, expose no ships to threatenings of the furrow-faced sea. I turn no monies in the public bank, nor you, sir, private. No, sir, nor devour soft prodigals. You shall have some will swallow a melting air as glibly as your Dutch will pills of butter and their purge for it. Tear forth the fathers of poor families out of their beds and coffin them alive in some kind clasping prison where their bones may be forthcoming when the flesh is rotten. But your sweet nature doth abhor these courses. You loathe the widows or the orphan's tears should wash your pavements, or their piteous cries ring in your roofs and beat the air for vengeance. Right, Mosca, I do loathe it. And besides, sir, you are not like a thresher that doth stand with a huge flail, watching a heap of corn and hungry, dares not taste the smallest grain, but feeds on mallows and such bitter herbs. Nor like the merchant, who hath filled his vaults with Romagna and rich Candian wines, yet drinks the lees of Lombard's vinegar. <laughs> you will not lie in straw, while moths and worms feed on your sumptuous hangings and soft beds. Oh, you know the use of riches, and dare give now from that bright heap to me, your poor observer, or to your dwarf, or your hermaphrodite, your eunuch, or what other household trifle, your pleasure allows maintenance. Hold thee, Mosca. And gives him some money. Take of my hand. Thou strikest on truth in all, and they are envious, term thee parasite. Call forth my dwarf, my eunuch, and my fool, and let them make me sport. Exit, Mosca. What should I do but cocker up my genius and live free to all delights my fortune calls me to? I have no wife, no parent, child, ally to give my substance to, but whom I make must be my heir. And this makes men observe me. This draws new clients daily to my house, women and men of every sex and age that bring me presents. Send me plate, coin, jewels with hope that when I die, which they expect each greedy minute, it shall then return tenfold upon them. While some, covered as above the rest, seek to engross me whole and counterwork the one unto the other, contend in gifts as they would seem in love, for which I suffer, playing with their hopes, and am content to coin them into profit to look upon their kindness and take more, and look on that, still bearing them in hand, letting the cherry knock against their lips and draw it by their mouths and back again. How now? And as we go into Act 1, Scene 2, enter Moscow with the not in any way problematic Nano, Androgino and Castrone. No, room for fresh gamesters. Who will you... Who do... Who do will you know? What? Who do will you know? You to know? They do bring you neither play nor university show, and therefore do entreat you that whatsoever they rehearse may not fare a whit the worse. For the false pace of the verse, if you wonder at if you wonder at this, you will wonder more ere we pass. For no, here is enclosed the soul of Pythagoras. The juggler divine, as hereafter shall follow, 
which soul, fast and loose, sir, came first from Apollo and was breathed into Athalides, Mercurius, his son, where it had the gift to remember all that ever was done. From thence it fled forth and made transmigration to Goldilocks Euphorbus, who was killed in good fashion at the siege of old Troy by the cuckold of Sparta. Hermontimus was next. I find it in my charta, to whom it did pass, where no sooner it was missing, but with one Pyrrhus of Delos, it learned to go fishing. And thence did it enter the sophist of Greece. From Pythagore, she went into a beautiful piece. Hi, Aspasia, the Meritrix. <laughs> and, the next, and the next also for her was again of a whore. She became a philosopher. Crates was the cynic, as itself does relate it, since kings, knights, and beggars, knaves, lords, and fools get it. Besides, ox and ass, camel, mule, goat, and brock. <coughs> in all which it had spoke, as in the cobbler's cock. But I come not here to discourse that matter. For his one, two, three, or his great oath, by quarter, his musics, his trigon, his golden thigh, or his telling how elements shift, but I would ask, how of late thou best suffered translation and shifted thy coat in these days of reformation? Like one of the reformed a fool, as you see, counting all old doctrine heresy. But not on thine own forbids meats, hast thou ventured? On fish, when first a Carthusian I entered. Why then? Thy dogmatical silence hath left thee. Of that an obstreperous lawyer bereft me. A wonderful change when Sir Lawyer forsook thee. For Pythagoras' sake, what body then took thee? A good dull mule. How? Oh, by the means thou wert brought to allow of the eating of beans? Yes. But from the mule into whom didst thou pass? Into a very strange beast, by some writers called an ass, by others a precise, pure, illuminate brother of those devour flesh, and sometimes one another, and will drop you forth a libel or a sanctified lie betwixt every spoonful of a nativity pie. Now quit thee, for heaven of that profane nation, and greatly report, gently report thy next transmigration. To the same that am I am. A creature of delight, and, what is more than a fool, a hermaphrodite. Now, pretty sweet soul, in all thy variation, which body wouldst thou choose to keep up thy station? Truth, this I am in, even here would I tarry. Because hmm. there is delight of each sex thou canst vary. Alas, those pleasures be stale and forsaken. No, tis your fool wherewith I am so taken, the only one creature that I can call blessed. Uh, for all other creatures I have proved most distressed. Spoke true, as thou wert in Pythagoras still, this learned, learned opinion we celebrate will. Fellow eunuch, as behooves us, with all our wit and art, to dignify that whereof ourselves are so great and special a part. <laughs> now very, very pretty. Mosca, this was thy invention. If it please my patron, not else. It doth good, Mosca. <laughs> then it was, sir. And uh, both Nano and uh, Castrone sing, uh, but I'll t I'll, I will take that on me. Fools, they are the only nation worth men's envy or admiration. Free from care or solo taking, selves and others merry making. All they speak or do is sterling. Your fool is he, your great man's darling. And your lady's sport and pleasure, tongue and bauble are his treasure. In his face begetteth laughter, and he speaks truth free from slaughter. He's the grace of every feast, and sometimes the greatest guest hath his trencher and his stool when wait wits upon the fool oh who would not be he 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 and there's a knocking on the door who's that away and exuant nano and castrone look mosca fool be gone and exit androgyno tis the new voltori the advocate 
I know him by his knock. Mm, fetch me my gown, my furs, nightcaps. Say, my couch is changing and let him entertain himself a while without the gallery. Exit Moscow. Now, now my clients begin their vis visitation. Vulture, kite, raven and gorecrow. All my birds of prey that think me turning carcass. Now they come. I'm not for them yet. Uh, Re-enter Moscow with his gown and various other uh, accoutrements. Now, now, the news. A piece of plate, sir. Of what bigness? <laughs> Massy and antique, with your name inscribed and arms engraven. Good. <laughs> and not a fox stretched on the earth with fine, delusive slights, mocking a gaping crow. <laughs> Mosca. <laughs> Sharp, sir. Give me my furs. And Mosca helps dress him. Why dost thou laugh so, man? I cannot choose so when I apprehend what thoughts he has without now as he walks. That this might be the last gift he should give. That this would fetch you if you died today and gave him all what he should be tomorrow. What large return would come of all his adventures. How he should worship to be and reverenced, ride with his furs and footcloths, waited on by her of fools and clients have clear way made for his mule as let it as himself be called the great and learned advocate and then concludes there's naught impossible <laughs> <laughs> yes to be learned Moscow oh no rich implies it put an ass with reverend purple so you can hide his two ambitious ears and he shall pass for a cathedral doctor uh, my caps my caps good Moscow Fetch him in. Uh, stay, sir. Your ointment for your eyes. That's true. Oh, dispatch, dispatch. I long to have possession of my new present. <laughs> that and thousands more I hope to see you, Lord of. <laughs> Thanks, kind Mosca. Is that what I am lost in blended dust and hundreds such as I am in succession? Uh, nay, that were too much, Mosca. You shall live still to delude these harpies. Loving Mosca. <laughs> Tis well. My pillow now, and let him enter. Exit Moscow. And now my feigned cough, <clears throat> my physic, and my gout, my apoplexy, palsy, and cat eyes. Help with your corset functions, this my posture, wherein this three year I have milked their hopes. He comes, I hear him. <coughs> <coughs> And we'll pause there before victim number one comes in. Um, so, yes, we've got a sense of the Volpone household. Uh, we've got uh, Volpone primary servant uh, Mosca and his entertainment system. I mean, he doesn't have Netflix. Um, he has these, these, these servants um, from marginalised communities who, who, who entertain him with this little sort of mini mask um that is is brought on for his entertainment to open the play um i i, I and again because uh, the, the 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 question field so nano is supposed to be someone of uh, small stature uh, androgyno uh is uh, someone uh, uh, modern day would probably say uh, uh well it might be a, a literally androgynous um uh, there's all sorts of questions as to precisely how you categorize the, the, these figures um uh, yes, and, and someone who is literally a cast uh, castrone, presumably is a castrato, um, and, and hence the fact that they're part of the singing troupe. Um, so, yeah, it's um, all sorts of uh, interesting questions as to where what one does with, with this material. Of course, they are the employees of someone who's not necessarily very nice. So there's, there's a whole series of uh, uh, questions of where that, where that goes. Uh, thoughts from the room on this sort of opening gambit? We're still technically in the middle of the first scene. It's just broken up into lots of little scenes lynn first yeah i mean where the play certainly establishes who volponi is right away let me look at my shrine and he goes on and on about how wonderful gold is like gold is the sun the sun of the, the sun but better than the sun gold is better than the sun um but even more than gold i love the way i get it and um you know i'm viewing this through a 
you know, my own 21st century lens, but basically he's bragging about the fact that he makes no economic contribution. He doesn't farm. He doesn't manufacture. He doesn't provide services. And he accumulates wealth in a way that doesn't actually do anything. Um, so, it, 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 yeah, Volpone's a really interesting part in the Western canon because he really does kind of need to be irresistibly charming in an evil way. But he's such a terrible person. But, but you know, you could argue he's a kind of Robin Hood, isn't he? He's robbing <laughs> the rich to feed, okay, himself. Um, <laughs> yeah. um, but, I mean, he's leeching off the people who are arguably leeches. I mean, he's reaching because mm -hmm. uh, yeah. you, you could yeah. argue this is the yeah. lie that con men always tell themselves. He's only ever conning a, uh, people who deserve it in the sense that the people who are giving him stuff, is, they're hoping for something in return because he's pretending to be horribly rich. Uh, well, you know, he is horribly rich, but that's because people keep giving him stuff. Um, uh, and, and that's the logic of, of, of the piece. Uh, Aliki. Yeah, and, and if we can take Mosca at his word, and I don't know that we can because he is obviously buttering up Volpone all the time, uh, then he's doing it without ever harming poor people at all, or at least not directly. He doesn't leave widows and orphans on the street. He gets the landlords. Mind you, he doesn't give it back yeah. to the widows and orphans, but you know what I mean. <laughs> yeah. Yes, r robs from the rich to give to him. Um, you know, and 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 you know, uh, there's, there's there's there's. I mean, it's it's not, it's not a brilliant. It doesn't make him a great person, but you know, uh, I, I don't think he's ever pretending to be a great person. Uh, uh, but well, maybe he is uh, in his his various guises. I and the same very theatrical about it all. You know, he's got his props. He's got his eye drops. I love the eye drops. And of course, the last thing <laughs> right? is you know, pluff up the pillow correctly. You know, we've got to set the mise en scène for the arrival of the first uh, uh, first victim uh and see how it's all going to flow uh sarah yes um yeah i th i think the you're, you're right lynn the, the it, he does have to be charming in some way but i think his charm comes from his cleverness it's mm -hmm. like i i really think it's like when you watch a, a modern day con or heist movie um these people are not necessarily good people you don't necessarily you you definitely don't want them in your in in your life, and you and you don't necessarily like approve of them morally, but you get the thing that hooks you in is 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 the cleverness because it's like are they going to get away with this, um, and because there's such a great setup here, you know, yeah, with 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 the with the making the eyes all watery and the you know getting getting the costume right, plumping up the pillars, it's it's like. The scene is, it's like we're, we're automatically invested in this con working um, because we've seen how it's being done. And so it's like, oh, is it going to work? And I think that's where the charm comes. It's not that, that it, it's not that he has to be a particularly charming person. It's just the cleverness of him needs to really come through. But to be honest, I think it would be impossible for it not to come through because it's it's there in the in the in dialogue. The yeah. yeah, I mean, it, 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 it's not quite playing the same game as most con, you know, modern con things do, which is that on some level, the con people are given some sort of redeeming quality uh, and you're supposed to actually like them. Uh, I mean, the, the, <laughs> this is a horrible person fleecing other horrible people um i i uh you know i he, he's entirely avaricious he's, he's not there's no sort of underlying social message that he's trying to convince you with he's, he doesn't care um well, uh Lynn. except it's a kind of negative example you know um yeah you know i think there is a a, a critique of all of our relationships with money in uh volponi's relationship with money um mm. <laughs> he's an exaggerated version of that but mm. but avarice is a is a common vice yeah uh, a leaky and then we'll move on i mean apart from the con bit he screwed mcduck right diving into his big uh mm. gold pot whatever it is gold uh yeah, yeah. And, it, and if Mosca just took one coin out of that pot, he'd just reach <laughs> in and go, there's one missing. <laughs> I can feel there's something not there. Um, 
But yeah, um, uh, okay, they've already been gloating over what Voltore uh, is going to be bringing. Um, uh, a big piece of plate, uh, I think they described it or something similar. So uh, Act 1, Scene 3, enter Mosca, bringing in Voltore with his whacking great bit of plate. You still are what you were, sir. Only you, of all the rest, are he commands his love. And you do wisely to preserve it thus with early visitation and kind notes of your good meaning to him, which I know, sir, cannot but come most grateful. Patron, sir. Oh, sorry, no. Patron, sir, his Signor Voltori is come. What say you? Sir, Signor Voltori is come this morning to visit you. <laughs> I thank him. And hath brought a piece of antique plate, brought of St Mark, with which he here presents you. He is welcome. Pray him to come more often. Yes. Bless he. He thanks you and desires you see him often. Mosca. My patron. Bring him near. Where is he? <laughs> I, I long to feel his hand. The plate is here, sir. How fare you, sir? I thank you, Signor Voltore. But where is the plate? My, my eyes are bad. I'm sorry to see you thus weak. <laughs> but he's not weaker. You are too. Magnificent. No, sir. Would heaven I could as well give health to you as that plate. Ah, oh, you give, sir, what you can. I, I thank you. Your love hath paced in this and shall not be unanswered. Patrick, <laughs> see me often. Yes, I shall, sir. Be not far from me. Do you observe that, sir? Hearken unto me, still a decade will concern you. You are a happy man, sir. Know your good. Oh, I cannot now last long. You are his heir, sir. Am I? Oh, I feel me going on. Oh, oh, I'm sailing to my port. <laughs> no, no, no. I am glad I am so near my haven. Alas, kind gentleman, well, we must all go. But Mosca? Age will conquer. Pray thee hear me. Am I inscribed his heir for certain? Are you? <laughs> Do beseech you, sir, you will vouchsafe to write me in your family. All my hopes depend upon your worship. I am lost, except the rising sun do shine on me. It shall but shine and warn thee, Mosca. Sir, I am a man that hath not done your love all the worst offices. Here I wear your keys. See all your coffers and your caskets locked. Keep the poor inventory of your jewels, your plate and monies. I'm your steward, sir. Husband your goods here. I'm not so heir. Without a partner, sir. Confirmed this morning. The wax is warm yet and the ink scarce dry upon the parchment. Happy, happy me! What good chance, sweet Mosca? Your dessert, sir. I know no second cause. Thy modesty is not to know it. Well, we shall require it. He ever liked your cause, sir. That first took him. I oft have heard him say how he admired men of your large profession that could speak to every cause and things mere contraries till they were hoarse again, yet all be law. That, with the most quick agility, could turn and re-return, could make knots and undo them, give forked counsel, take provoking gold on either hand and put it up. These men he knew would thrive with their humility. For his part, he thought he should be blessed to have his air of such a suffering spirit, so wise, so grave, of so perplexed a tongue and loud withal, that would not wag, nor scarce lie still without a fee, when every word your worship lets fall is a chicken. Another knocks. 
Who's that? One Knox. I would not have you seen, sir. And yet, oh, pretend you came and went in haste. Oh, I'll fashion an excuse. Oh, and gentle sir, when you do come to swim in gold lard, up to the arms in honey, that your chin is borne up stiff with fatness of the flood, think on your vassal. But remember me. I have not been the worst of clients, your worst of clients. Scott. When will you have your inventory brought, sir? Or see a copy of the will? Anon, I will bring them to you, sir. Away, be gone. Put business in your face. Exit Voltore. Uh, Volpone leaps up. Excellent, Mosca. Come hither, let me kiss thee. Keep you still, sir. Here is Corbaccio. Set the plate away. The vulture's gone and the old ravens come. Act four, act one, scene four. It take you to your silence and your sleep. Stand there and multiply. Said, putting uh, the plate in its, uh, in its, uh, with all the rest of the loot. Now, shall we see a wretch who is indeed more impotent than this can feign to be, yet hopes to hop over his grave? Enter Corbaccio. Signor Corbaccio! You're very welcome, sir. How does your patron? Troth, as he did, sir, no amends. What? Mends he? No, sir, he's rather worse. That's well. Where is he? Upon his couch, sir, newly fallen asleep. Does he sleep well? No, wink, sir, all this night, nor yesterday, but slumbers. Good. He should take some counsel of physicians. I have brought him an opiate here from my own doctor. He will not hear of drugs. Why? I myself stood by while it was made, saw all the ingredients, and know it cannot but most gently work. My life for his, tis but to make him sleep. Ay, his last sleep, if you would take it. Sir, he has no faith in physic. Say you, say you? He has no faith in physic. He does think... Most of your doctors are the greater danger and worse disease to escape. I have often heard him protest that your physician should never be his heir. Not your physician, sir. I did not mean it. No, sir, nor their fees. He can't, no, sir, nor their fees he cannot brook. He says they flay a man before they kill him. Right, I do conceive you. And then they do it by experiment, for which the law not only doth absolve them, but gives them great reward, and he is loath to hire his death so. It is true, they kill with as much license as a judge. Nay, more, for he but kills, sir, when the law condemns, and these can kill him too. I, for, or me, or any man. How does his apoplex, is that strong in him still? most violent. His speech is broken and his eyes are set. His face drawn longer than twas want. How? How stronger than it was want? Uh, no, sir. His face drawn longer than twas want. Oh, good. His mouth is ever gaping and his eyelids hang. Good. A freezing numbness stiffens all his joints and makes the colour of his flesh like lead. Oh, it is good. His pulse beats slow and dull. Good symptoms still. And from his brain. I conceive you. Good. Flows a cold sweat with a continual room for the resolved corners of his eyes. It's possible. Yet I am better. <laughs> How does he with the swimming of his head? Oh, sir, tis past the scotomy. He now hath lost his feeling and hath left to snort. You hardly can perceive him that he breathes. Excellent, excellent. Sure, I shall outlast him to make this makes me young again a score of years. I was a coming for you, sir. Has he made his will? What has he given me? No, sir. Nothing, huh? He has not made his will, sir. Oh, oh. But what did Voltori, the lawyer, hear? 
Well, he smelt a carcass, sir, when he but heard my master was about his testament, as I did urge him to it for your good. He came unto him, did he? I thought so. Yes, and presented him this piece of plate. To be his heir? I do not know, sir. True, I know it too. By your own scale, sir. Well, I shall prevent him yet. See, Mosca, look, here I have bought a bag of, of bright check queens. Will quite weigh down his plate. Yay, marry, sir, this is true physic. This, your sacred medicine. No talk of opiates to this great elixir. <laughs> Tis arum palpabile, if not potabile. It shall be ministered to him in his bowl. Aye, do, do, do. Most blessed cordial, this will recover him. Yes, do, do, do. I think it were not best, sir. What? To recover him. Oh, no, 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 by no means. Why, sir, this will work some strange effect if he but feel it. Tis true, therefore forbear, I'll take my venture, give it me again. Ah, no hand upon me. You shall not do yourself that wrong, sir. I will so advise you, you shall have it all. Oh, how? All, sir, tis your right, your own. No man can claim a part, tis yours, without a rival. Decreed by destiny. How? How? I'll tell you, sir, this fit he shall recover. Oh, I do conceive you. And on first advantage of his gained sense, I will re-importune him unto the making of his testament and show him this. Pointing to the Good. money. Good. It is better yet. If you will hear me, sir. With all my heart. Now, would I counsel you, make home with speed, there frame a will, where to you shall inscribe my master your sole heir. And disinherit my son? Oh, sir, the better, for that colour shall make it much more taking. Oh, but colour? This will, sir. You shall send it unto me. Now, when I come to enforce, as I will do, your cares, your watchings, and your many prayers, your more than many gifts, your this day's present, and last, produce your will, where... Without thought or least regard unto your proper issue, a son so brave and highly meriting the stream of your diverted love hath thrown you upon my master and made him your heir. Well, you cannot be so stupid or stone dead, but out of conscience and mere gratitude. He must pronounce me his. Tis true. This plot did I think on before. Oh, I do believe it. Do you not believe it? Yes, sir. Mine own project. Which, when he hath done, sir? Published me his heir. And you so certain to survive him? I, Being so lusty a man. Tis true. Yes, sir. I thought on that too. See how he should be this very organ to express my thoughts. You have not only done yourself a good. But multiplied it on my son. Tis right, sir. Still my invention. Lass, sir, heaven knows, it hath been all my study, all my care. I e'en grow grey with all. How to work things. I do conceive you, sweet Mosca. You are he for whom I labour here. I do, do, do. I'll straight about it. And going? Rook, go with you, raven. I know thee, honest. <laughs> you do lie, sir. And your knowledge is no better than your ears, sir. I do not doubt to be a father to thee. Nor I to call my brother of his blessing. I may have my youth restored to me. Why not? <laughs> your worship is a precious ass. What sayest thou? I do desire your worship to make haste, sir. It is done. It is done. I go. Exit Corbaccio. <laughs> oh, I shall first <laughs> laugh my side <laughs> my side contain your flux of laughter sir you know this hope is such a bait it covers any hook oh but thy working and thy placing it i cannot hold good rascal let me kiss thee 
I never knew thee in so rare a humour. Alas, sir, I but do as I am taught. Follow your grave instructions. Give them words. Pour oil into their ears and send them hence. Is true, tis true. What a rare punishment is avarice to itself. Aye, with our help, sir. <laughs> so many cares, so many maladies, so many fears attending on old age. Yea, death so often called on, as no wish can be more frequent with them. Their limbs faint, their senses dull, their seeing, hearing, going all dead before them. Yea, their very teeth, their instruments of eating failing them, yet this is reckoned life. Nay, here was one is now gone home that wishes to li live longer, feels not his gout nor palsy, feigns himself younger by scores of years, flatters his age with confident belying it, hopes he may with charms like Eson have his youth restored and with these thoughts so battens as if fate would be as easily cheated on as he and all turns heir. Another knocks. Who's that there now? A third? Close to your couch again. I hear his voice. It is Corvino, a spruce merchant. Dead. Oh, another bout, sir, with your eyes. Anoints the eyes again. Who's there? Act one, scene five, enter Corvino. Signor Corvino, come, most wished for. Oh, how happy were you if you knew it now? Aye, what? Wherein? The tardy hour is come, sir. He's not dead? Not dead, sir, but as good. He knows no man. How shall I do then? Why, sir? I brought him here a pearl. Perhaps he has so much remembrance left as to know you, sir. He still calls on you. Nothing but your name is in his mouth. Is your Pearl Orient, sir? Venice was never owner of the like. Signor Corvino. Hark. Signor Corvino. Oh, he calls you. Step and give it him. He's here, sir, and he has brought you a rich pearl. How do you, sir? Tell him it doubles the twelfth cataract. Uh, sir, he cannot understand his hearing's gone, and yet it comforts him to see you. Say, I have a diamond for him too. Best show it, sir. Put it into his hand. Tis only there he apprehends. He has his feeling yet. <gasps> see how he grasps it. That's good gentleman. How pitiful the sight is. Oh, forget, sir. The weeping of an heir should still be laughter under a visor. Why, am I his heir? Sir, I am sworn I may not show the will till he be dead. But here has been Corbaccio, here has been Voltori, here were others too. I cannot number them, there were so many, all gaping here for legacies. But I... Taking the vantage of his naming you, Signor Corvino, Signor Corvino, took paper and pen and ink, and there I asked him whom he would have his heir. Corvino, who should be executor, um, executor, Corvino. And to any question he was silent to, I still interpreted the nods he made through weakness for consent, and sent home the others. Nothing between them but to cry and curse. Oh, my dear Mosca. And they embrace. Does he not perceive us? Oh, no more than a blind harper. He knows no man, no face of friend, nor name of any servant who twas that who it was that fed him last night or gave him drink. Not those he hath begotten or brought up can he remember. Has he children? Bastards. Some dozen or more that he begot on beggars, gypsies and Jews and black moors when he was drunk. Knew you not that, sir? Tis the common fable. The dwarf, the fool, the eunuch are all his. He's the true father of his family and all, uh, save me. But he has given them nothing. Well, that's well, that's well. I'm sure he does not hear us. Oh, sure, sir. Why, look you. Credit your own sense. And shouts... 
The pox approach and add to your diseases if it would send you hence the sooner, sir, for your incontinence. It hath deserved it thoroughly and thoroughly and the plague to boot. You may come near, sir. Would you once close those filthy eyes of yours that flow with slime like two frog pits and those same hanging cheeks covered with his hide instead of skin? Nay, help, sir, that look like frozen dish clout set on end. An old smoked wall on which the rain ran down in streaks. Oh, excellent, sir. Speak out. You may be louder yet. A culverin discharge in his ear would hardly bore it. His nose is like a common sewer still running. Oh, tis good. And what his mouth? A very draught. Oh, stop it up. By no means. Oh, pray you, let me. Faith, I could stifle him rarely with the pillow as well as any woman that should keep him. Do as you will, but I'll be gone. Oh, be so. It is your presence make us, makes him last so long. I pray you, use no violence. No, sir? Why? Why should you be thus scrupulous, pray you, sir? No, uh, your discretion. Oh, well, good sir. Be gone. I will not trouble him now to take my pearl. <laughs> Nor your diamond. What a needless care is this afflicts you. Is not all here yours? Am not I here, whom you have made your creature, that owe my being to you? Grateful, Mosca. Thou art my friend, my fellow, my companion, my partner and shall share in all my fortunes. Excepting one. What's that? Oh, your gallant wife, sir. Exit Corvino. Now he is gone. We had no other means to shoot him hence but this. <laughs> my divine Mosca, thou hast today outgone thyself. Another Knox. Well, who's there? I will be troubled with no more. Prepare me music, dances, banquets, all delights. The Turk is not more sensual in his pleasures than Will Volpone. Exit Mosca. Let me see a pearl, a diamond plate, check-ins, good morning's purchase. Oh, it is better than Rob Church's, yet, or fat by eating once a month. A man. Enter Mosca. Who is it? The beauteous lady would be, sir. Wife to the English knight. Sir Politic would be, this is the style, sir, is directed me, hath sent to know how you have slept tonight and if you would be visited. Not now. Some three hours hence. I told the squire so much. When I am high with mirth and wine, then, then. For heaven, I wonder at the desperate valour of the bold English that they dare let loose their wives to all encounters. Sir, this knight has not his name for nothing. He is politic. And hmm. knows, howe'er his wife affects strange airs, she hath not yet the face to be dishonest. But had she Signor Corvino's wife's face? Has she so rare a face? Oh, sir. The wonder, the blazing star of Italy. Oh, a wench of the first year, a beauty ripe as harvest, whose skin is whiter than a swan all over, than silver, snow, or oh, lilies. Oh, a soft lip would tempt you to eternity of kissing, and flesh that melteth in the touch to blood. Mm, bright as your gold, and lovely as your gold. Why had I not known this before? Alas, sir, myself but yesterday discovered it. How might I see her? Oh, not possible. She's kept as warily as is your gold. Never does come abroad, never takes air but at a window. All her looks are sweet as the first grapes or cherries. And are watched as near as they are. I must see her. Sir, there is a guard of spies ten thick upon her. All his whole household, each of which is set upon his fellow, and have all their charge when he goes out, when he comes in, examined. I will go see her, though, but at her window. In some disguise, then. That is true. I must maintain mine own shape, still the same. We'll think. 
And off they go to set up Act 2. Um, so Act 1, very much a game. Uh, uh, it's the same game each time. You get three stabs at gulling people but the different characteristics and the different game plays i mean and and this is full of little acting games it, it's full of things for you to play i mean this whole thing of shout in his ear he won't react and of course volpeno has to not react but by reacting so you, you know there's got to be a sense of they, they whenever he turn <laughs> that particular gull turns his head away from volpeno volpeno's going <laughs> You know that you know every time they shout, his legs leaping up out out of sight behind them or something in pain. Um, but then also just the whole shouting at the 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 the, the obviously deaf, uh, old you know the 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 older uh, cat, uh, gull who comes in who's going, I'm so young and sprightly and is clearly the mo more likely to drop dead any second. Um, and so so there's lots of gameplay, and you can understand why this is. This is a popular play for um, for actors. You can understand why uh, it's very appealing for a star turn or two here because you've got two excellent parts that you can uh, rotate, and then you've also got really good sort of second fiddle parts that you can you can double or play around with. Because to a degree, if they didn't happen to all turn up in the same scene later on, uh, you could almost have the same actor going off, changing costume, coming straight back on again uh, for all of these gulling, gulling things. Um, we get three of them, but they are suitably different, that they don't feel too samey. Uh, it is the same game every time, um, and I'm sure trims and plays could be could be made here. But there is a sort of sense that this whole act has just been has just been a game. It doesn't move the plot on very much further um, after about you know five minutes. But it's 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 clearly really fun um, and really enjoyable. It, the question is, is it more enjoyable for the actors than for the audience? That's always the dangerous one here. Uh, actors, I'm sure, love this this whole act, but. Uh, by by goal number two and by goal number three, is the audience still enjoying it as much as the actors are? Always my worry. Uh, Alan? Yeah, I mean, so far it's almost looking like the player's misnamed because it's much more the Mosca show mm. with Volpone acting as the feed. Well, uh, yes and no. I mean, it, it, uh, 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 Volpone's still got a lot to do even if he's not necessarily saying anything. But you're right, Mosca is the more verbose um, in, in or has more opportunity to be verbose. Um, that may or may not change with Volpone's next disguise as we go into Act 2 and beyond. Uh, Sarah? Yes, I, 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 I see what you, what you mean uh, about how this, the actors could be enjoying this more than the audience. However, I, I don't think there's much chance of that happening um, as long as it's tight. Um, you know, which obviously it would be uh, with rehearsal. Um, I think the audience are going to enjoy this just as much as the, as the actors because they are different. You know, um, the names give it away. You know, they're all they're all carrion. They're all named after carrion birds, birds that, that, that come and, you know, peck at, peck at the remains of, you know, dead things. Um, but there you've got the vulture, you've got the raven, You've got the carrion crow, so there's a there's like a there's a difference in um, maybe a, dif a a physical difference in stature, but you've also got different approaches. And I I found the scene um, with uh, Corvino. Was it Corvino or was it? I'm getting them confused now. Uh, no, Corbaccio. Um, I found the scene with Corbaccio really interesting um, because because of the the speech that Volponi has afterwards um where he where you know because it brings something else into the mix he's yes he's he's wanting to be um made his uh, Volponi's heir and he's wanting all the money and he's wanting all the riches but also you know he is clearly very doddery um himself and it's this thing of yeah he he's 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 so frightened of death he's so he's desperate to be um you know he's desperate for anything that's going to make him feel younger and and you know this is what makes him feel younger you know in, in other cons in other plays it would be like oh yes here have this cream put it on your face you'll look 10 years younger or, or whatever but here it's no you can be his heir 
he's going to die and you can be his heir and that is enough to make him feel like he's sprightly and he's young and he's still got life in him and that's really i think what the value is uh for corbaccio because he's he's just he's terrified of death and he 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 what he, he he wants whatever it whatever it takes to to make him feel like he's there's still life in the old dog yet so i think you know th- there's some quite interesting stuff going on like behind the obvious con and um it's just so clever i don't think the audience are going to get bored with it you know three is the magic number and um also it's gonna yes because the door knocks and then they say no to no we can't, we're not doing a fourth uh, one it's I'm, like ben ben johnson knows his business he knows that four would just be too many they, they um, are characters we will encounter but in a different form in a moment yeah yeah so it's it's like i i yeah i i think as long as it's fast, as long as it's pithy, as long as the audience are in on the joke, which they will be, um, I, I think it would be massively enjoyable for an audience. And you know, and Corbaccio has these you know wonderful moments. You know, it's like all the this will this will uh, bring my master back to life and pouring gold into a coin. You can imagine what Volpone is doing, just going ah, <laughs> uh, at that moment. And then Mosca has to remind him, we're not trying to save him. Yeah. Um, <laughs> We don't want him to recover. Oh, no, no, we don't. Oh, um, how about some opium? Uh, yeah. <laughs> why don't we give him just some... Just put him this pillow. This, and it's yeah, like, oh, get... use your own discretion. It's yeah, like... well, the various different... Yeah, but it's like uh, brazenly just turning up with, here is a bottle of... This will help him. This yeah. won't kill him at all. No. And it's just... Christ. <laughs> um... Yeah, so, yeah, lots of variation between the different... Even though it's the same game, they, they keep the game turning over. So, yeah. Uh, OK. Um, we're going to move to a slightly different sphere as we go to Act 2. Uh, Act 2! Um, and we have an introduction now. They were mentioned... In, well, we had some mentioning of characters in passing. Uh, so we're now going to meet Sir Politic Woodby as we go to Act 2, Scene 1, and Peregrine. Peregrine, Peregrine, I don't know. Uh, enter Sir Politic Woodby and Peregrine. Uh, to a wise man, all the world is soil. It is not Italy, nor France, nor Europe, as bound me, my fate score me forth. Yet, I protest, it is no salt desire, seeing countries, shifting a religion, nor any disaffection to the state where I was bred, and unto which I owe my dearest plots, hath brought me out, much less that idle, antique, stale, grey-headed project of knowing men's minds and manners with Ulysses, but a peculiar humour of my wife's, laid for this height of Venice to observe, to quote, to learn the language, and so forth. I hope you travel, sir, with licence. Yes. I dare the safelier converse. How long, sir, since you left England? Seven weeks. So lately? You have not been with my Lord Ambassador? Uh, not yet, sir. Pray you, what news, sir, vents our climate? I heard last night a most strange thing reported by some of my Lord's followers. And I long to hear how twill be seconded. What was it, sir? Marry, sir. Of a raven that should build a ship royal of the kings. This fellow, does he gull me, Trow, or is gulled? Uh, your name, sir? My name is uh, Politic Woodby. <laughs> oh, that speaks him. A knight, sir. A poor knight, sir. Your lady lies here in Venice for intelligence of tires and fashions and behaviour among the courtesans? That fine lady would be? Yes, sir. Uh, the spider and the bee, oft times, suck from one flower. A good sir, politic. I cry you mercy. I have heard much of you. Tis true, sir, of your raven. On your knowledge? Yes. And your lion's whelping in the tower? Another whelp? Another, sir. Now, heaven, what prodigies be these? The fires of Berwick and the new star? These things concurring? Strange and full of omen. Saw you those meteors? I did, sir. Fearful. Pray you, sir, confirm me. Were there three porpoises seen above the bridge as they give out? Six and a sturgeon. 
I'm astonished. Nay, sir, be not so. I'll tell you a greater prodigy than these. What should these things portend? The very day, let me be sure, that I put forth from London, there was a whale discovered in the river, as high as Norwich, and uh, that had waited there for no how many months, few knew no how many months, for the subversion of the stowed fleet. Is possible? Believe it, t'was either sent from Spain or the Archduke's. Spinola's well upon my life, my credit. Will they not leave these projects? Worthy, sir, some other news? Faith, Stone the Fool is dead, <laughs> and they do lack a tavern fool extremely. Is my stone dead? He's dead, sir. Why, I hope you thought him not immortal. Oh, this night, were he well known, would be a precious thing to fit our English stage. He that should write, but such a fellow, should be thought to feign extremely, if not maliciously. Stone dead? Dead. Lord, how deeply, sir, you apprehend it. He was no kinsman to you. That I know of. Well, that same fellow was an unknown fool. And yet you knew him, it seems. I did so, sir. I knew him one of the most dangerous heads within, living within the state, and so I held him. Indeed, sir. While he lived in action, he has received weekly intelligence upon my knowledge out of the Low Countries, for all parts of the world, in cabbages, and those dispensed again to ambassadors in oranges, muskmelons, apricots, lemons, pomme citron, and such like, sometimes in Colchester oysters and your saucy cockles. You make me wonder, sir. Sir, upon my knowledge, nay, I've observed him at your public ordinary, take his advertisement from a traveller, a concealed statesman, in a trencher of meat, and instantly, before the meal was done, convey an answer in a toothpick. Strange. How could this be, sir? Why, the meat was cut so like his character, and so laid as he must easily read the cipher. I have heard he could not read, sir. Search was given out, in policy, by those that did employ him. But he could read, and had to your languages, and to it as sound a novel. I have heard, sir, that your baboons were spies, and that they were a kind of subtle nation, near to China. Ay, your Mamelucci. Faith, they had their hand in a French pot or two, but they were so extremely given to women, as they made discovery of all. Yet I had my advices here on Wednesday last, from of their own coat. They were returned, made their relations as the fashion is, and now stand fair for fresh employment. Art, this Sir Paul will be ignorant of nothing. It seems, sir, you know all. Not all, sir, but I have some general notions. I do love to note and to observe, though I live out free from the active torrent, yet I'd mark the currents and passages of things for my pro own private use, and I know the ebbs and flows of state. Believe it, sir, I hold myself in no small tie unto my fortunes for casting me thus luckily upon you, whose knowledge, if your bounty equal it, may do me great assistance in instruction for my behaviour and my bearing, which is yet so rude and raw. Why, came you forth empty of miles, of rules for travel? Faith, I had some common ones, but uh, from out that vulgar grammar which... He that cried Italian to me taught me. Why, this is it. It is that spoilt all our brave bloods, trusting our hopeful gentry under pedants, fellows of outside and mere bark. You seem to be a gentleman of ingenuous race. I not profess it, but my faith had, faith had been to be where I have been consulted with in this high kind, touching some great men's sons. Persons of blood and honour. And we'll pause there. Uh, they remain on stage, but people are about to enter and join them. Um, I think it's fair to say this is 
doing a slightly different job of work, isn't it? Um, this is uh, doing a certain amount of social satire of the time. It seems to be referring to specific events. It's doing this sort of uh, Englishman uh, abroad who mm. uh, is talking to someone who he, he just is, he thinks is a bit of an idiot um, and, and is slightly mocking him. So it's a slightly harder scene to play with um, because... I mean, you could you could throw in some more modern references there, or do something with it. Um, but it, it it's a it's a it's a it, I'm sh I'm sure it went down a storm in you know 1605 1606. But it's a little harder to sort of engage with because it's it's verbal play it, it, rather than a scene you can play with the game of the scene. Even if you don't always even if you're a bit lost in the words of the act one, the action carries it over. Um, whereas this feels more referential and more textual. Um, uh, Sarah? Um, I think you could make it work for a modern audience if you just really lean into the whole Englishman abroad thing. Um, you know, the kind of... I mean, it's two Englishmen abroad, isn't it? They're both English. Mm. So it's that thing of like, oh, I'm going to talk to you because you're English. <laughs> You know, it's yeah. like I, I wouldn't bother. To, I wouldn't bother talking to the Italians. Neither of them probably know any Italian. Um, but like, even if they did, it's like, oh no, oh, I can talk to you because you are my equal. And there's that. I think if you really lean into that whole pompous, arrogant thing of the the little British are abroad, you you could actually get through quite a lot of this dialogue without the audience getting. The references because even though they don't get the specific references they will get the game that's being played they'll get the um they'll get the joke of what the setup is and what's happening and provided provided the scene doesn't go on too long you might have to maybe make a few cuts or and provided the actors are kind of brisk about it and very clear in their intentions, I, I think an audience would still um, find it funny. Hmm. I, I, I think it's, it, it, I mean, the thing is structurally what it's here to do is to separate Volpone's exit and entrance mm. um, and, and to give everyone a little bit of a breather because they've just had a massive scene. Um, yeah, I think I think it 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 there's there's a bit too much, and we've got to cut this play down a bit. By the way, I mean there there is you know there's a lot of text here. Uh, it's as it's about as long as the Janus uh, was, the, which we've done relatively recently, and you know it's a comedy. Um, so, you know, so Janus is allowed to be long. Yeah. Comedies yeah. have to be shorter than this. Yeah. Um, by law and decree. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Lynn. Yeah, three-hour comedy is a contradiction in terms. Mm. Or, or my used to say that um yeah it's 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 kind of yeah editing this would be work because um like you, like you say comedy needs to be shorter uh but i think this as sarah says this could be funny especially if like politic would be and he's talking so fast we can't even we can't really parse what he's saying but it doesn't matter he's just this sort of you know Englishman ab abroad who thinks he knows everything or, or or wants to be viewed as knowing everything. And Peregrine, I take it, is kind of a more reasonable character, has a reason, it, you know, per the, you know, the Peregrine Falcon travels, you know, Peregrine is, is to travel. So he's actually a real traveler. Um, uh, so, I mean, I think it could be, it could be funny. And uh, I was going to say earlier, the, the, the plotting of this is really, really good when we're sort of ready for the for something different to happen because at the end of the previous act Volpone hears about one of his Mark's beautiful wife and it's like oh I gotta go look at her so mm. that's actually a plot point mm. you think he's all about the money but he's also a horn dog um so uh the stakes change that signals to the audience and in perhaps an unconscious way that we've got said that that's a turning point that when he turns from just greedy and soaking people for their valuables, that's one thing. But when he starts lusting after another man's wife, the stakes have changed. So that's a plot. We, we know that's a turning point. And then we start in, in a different location with um, a different set of characters. So in a way we're prepped for this. Mm. 
we're yeah. lacking. And, and, you know, there are some interesting political things that might have relations. I mean, there, there's all the spying stuff that they're sort of talking about, which is done in a very absurd fashion, but not actually completely absurd because the spying universe is is inherently silly in so many ways. Um, uh, so there, 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 there is I, it's just this. That, that's a, a section that just, I think, needs work in the way that. The act one just needs working. You just need to put the work yeah, yeah. in and make it to make it good. Whereas this, you need to make some choices about what you're doing with it to make it sing. Okay, we need to move on. Act two, scene two is a continuation. Uh, Mosca and Nano come on. They're disguised. They're bringing on uh, with some other people materials to set up a stage. Uh, oh. Peregrine sees them coming. Sorry about that. Who be these, sir? Oh, under that window, there it must be. Uh, the same. Just to mount a bank. Your instructor in the dear tongues never discoursed you of the Italian mountebanks. Yes, sir. Why, here you shall see one. They are quack salvers, fellows that live by venting oils and drugs. Was that the character that I gave you of them? As I remember. It is ignorance. They are the only knowing men of Europe. Great general scholars, excellent physicians, most admired statesmen, professed favourites, and cabinet counsellors to the greatest princes, the only languaged men of all the world. And I have heard they are the most lewd impostors, <laughs> made of all terms and shreds, no less be liars of great men's favours than their own vile medicines which they will utter upon monstrous oaths, selling that drug for tuppence ere they part, which they have valued at twelve crowns before. Sir, uh, calumnies are answered best with silence. You yourself shall judge. Who is it mounts, my friends? Scuto of Mantua, sir. Is he? Nay, then, I'll proudly promise, sir, you shall behold another man that's been fancied to you. And a yet that he should mount his bank, here in this nook, that has been wont to appear in the face of the plaza. Here he comes. And enter Volpone, disguised as a mountebank. Mount Zany. Oh, follow, 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 follow. See how the people follow him. He's a man may write 10,000 crowns in bank here. <coughs> Uh, all ponies uh, got onto the stage by now. Note, mark but his gesture. I do use to observe the state he keeps in getting up. Tis worth it, sir. Most noble gentlemen and my worthy patrons, it may seem strange that I, your Scotto Mantuano, who was ever forewont to fix my bank in the face of the public piazza near the shelter of the portico to the Procuratia, should, after eight months' absence from this illustrious city of Venice, humbly retire myself into an obscure nook of the piazza. Did not I now object the same? A piece, sir. Let me tell you, I am not as your Lombard proverb saith cold on my feet, or content to part with my commodities at a cheaper rate than I accustomed. Look not for it, nor that the calumnious reports of that impudent detractor and shame to our profession, Alessandro Butone, I mean, who gave out in public I was condemned as forzato to the galleys for poisoning the Cardinal Bembo's cook. Have at all attached, much less dejected me. No, no, worthy gentlemen, to tell you true, I cannot endure to see the rabble of these ground Carlitani that spread their cloaks on the pavement as if they meant to do feats of activity, and then come in lamely with their mouldy tails out of Boccaccio like stale Tabarine the Fabulist, some of them discoursing their travels and of their tedious captivity in the Turks' galleys when, indeed, were the truth known, they were the Christians' galleys, where very temperately they eat 
bread and drunk water as a wholesome penance and joined them by their confessors for base pilferies. Despairing and contempt of these. These turdy, facey, nasty, pety, lousy, farticle robes with one poor groat's worth of unprepared antimony finally wrapped up in several scatochios are able very well to kill their twenty a week and play yet these meagre starved spirits who have half stopped the organs of their minds with earthy opulations want not their favours among your shriveled salad-eating artisans were overjoyed that they may have their half pennyworth of physic though it purge them into another world it makes no matter excellent you have heard better language sir well let them go and gentlemen honourable gentlemen know that for this time our bank being thus removed from the clamours of the canalia shall be the scene of pleasure and delight. For I have nothing to sell, little or nothing to sell. I told you, sir, his end. You did so, sir. I protest. I and my six servants are not able to make of this precious liquor so fast as it is fetched away from my lodging by gentlemen of your city. Strangers of the terra firma, worshipful merchants, I and senators too, who ever since my arrival have detained me to their uses by their splendidous liberalities unworthily. For what avails your rich man to have his magazines stuffed with muscadelli or of the purest grape when his physicians prescribe him on pain of death to drink nothing but water? Cocked with aniseeds. Oh, health, health, the blessing of the rich, the riches of the poor, who can buy thee at too dear a rate, since there is no enjoying this world without thee. Be not then so sparing of your purses, honourable gentlemen, as to abridge the natural course of life. You see his end. It's not good. For when a humid flux or catar by the mutability of air falls from your head into an arm or shoulder or any other part, take you a ducat or your check-in of gold and apply to the place affected. See what good effect it can work? No, no. Is the blessed Ungento this a rare extraction that hath only the power to dispense all, disperse all malignant humours that proceed either of cold or hot, moist or windy causes? I would he had put in dry too. Are you observe? To fortify the most indigest and crude stomach, I it were one that through extreme weakness vomited blood applying only a warm napkin to the place after the unction and frigate chase for the vertigine in the head, putting but a drop into your nostrils, likewise, behind the ears, most sovereign and approved remedy, the malcaduco, cramps, convulsions, paralysis, epilepsies, tremor, cordia, retiring nerves, ill papers of the spleen, stopping of the liver, the stone, the strangulary, hernia ventosa, ilicia pasio, stops a dysenteria immediately, easeth the torsion of the small guts, and cures all melancholia hypochondriaca being taken and applied according to my printed receipt. Pointing to his bill in his glass. For this is the physician, this the medicine, this counsels, this cures, this gives the direction, this works the effect, and in some, both together, may be termed an abstract of the theoric and practic of the Esculapian art. It will cost you eight rounds, and Sanfridata, <clears throat> please, uh, prithee, sing a verse extempore in honour of it. How do you like him, sir? Most strangely, I. Is not his language rare? 
but alchemy I never heard the like, or Broughton's books. Had old Hippocrates or Galen that to their books put medicines all in, but known this secret they had never, of which they will be guilty ever, been murderers of so much paper, or wasted many hurtless taper, no Indian drug had e'er been famed, tobacco sassafras not named, nor yet of Gorkum one small stick, sir, nor Raymond's lullies great elixir, ne had been known the Danish Gonswort, or Paracelsus with his longsword. Oh. Who's? <laughs> Sorry. Uh, and yet, and this yet will not do. Eight crowns is high. No more. Gentlemen, if I had but time to discourse to you the miraculous effects of this my oil, surnamed Olio di Scotto, with the countless catalogue of those I have cured of the aforesaid and many more diseases, the patents and privileges of all the princes and commonwealths of Christendom, or but the depositions of those that appeared on my part before the signory of the Sanita and most learned college of physicians where I was authorized upon notice taken of the admirable virtues of my medicaments and my own excellency in the matter of rare and unknown secrets, not only to disperse them publicly in this famous city, but in all the territories that happily joy under the government of the most pious and magnificent states of Italy. But may some other gallant fellow say, Oh, there be diverse that make profession to have as good and as experiment receipts as yours. Indeed, very many have essayed like apes in imitation of that which is really and essentially in me to make of this oil bestowed great cost in furnaces, stills, alembecs, continual fires, and in preparation of the ingredients, as indeed. There goes to it 600 several simples, besides some quantity of human fat for the conglutination, which we buy of the anatomists. <clears throat> but when these practitioners come to the last decoction, blow, blow, puff, puff, and all flies in for <laughs> Poor wretches. I rather pity their folly and indiscretion than their loss of time and money. For these may be recovered by industry, but to be a fool born is a disease incurable. For myself, I always from my youth have endeavored to get the rarest secrets and book them either in exchange or for money. I spared not cost nor labor where anything was worthy to be learned. And gentlemen, honorable gentlemen, I will undertake by virtue of chemical art, out of the honorable hat that covers your head to extract the four elements, that is to say fire, air, water, and earth, and to return you your felt without burn or stain. For whilst others have been at the baloo, I have been at my book and am now past the craggy paths of study and come to the flowery plains of honor and reputation. To assure you, sir, that is his aim. But to our price. And that with all, Sir Paul. You know, honourable gentlemen, I never, never valued this ampulla or vial at less than eight crowns. But for this time, I am content to be deprived of it for six. Six crowns is the price. And less in courtesy, I know you cannot offer me. Take it or leave it. Howsoever, both it and I am at your service. I ask you not as the value of the thing, for then I should demand of you a thousand crowns. So the cardinals, Montalto, Fernese, the great Duke of Tuscany, my gossip, with diverse other princes have given me, but I despise money, only to show my affection to you. Honourable gentlemen, and your illustrious state here, I have neglected the messages of these princes, mine own offices, framed my journey hither only to present you, you with the fruits of my travels, 
tune your voices once more to the touch of your instruments and give the Honorable Assembly some delightful recreation. What monstrous and most painful circumstance is here to get some three or four gazettes, some threepence on the whole, but that will come to. You that would last long, list to my song, make no more coil, but buy this oil. Would you be ever fair and young, stout of teeth and strong of tongue, tart of palate, quick of ear, sharp of sight, of nostril clear, moist of hand and light of foot, or I will come nearer to it. Would you live free from all diseases? Do the act your mistress pleases. <laughs> Yet fright all aches from your bones. Here's a medicine for the knowns. Well. I am in a humor at this time to make a present of the small quantity my coffer contains to the rich in courtesy and to the poor for God's sake. Wherefore, now Mark, I asked you six crowns and six crowns at other times you have paid me. You shall not give me six crowns, nor five, nor four, nor three, nor two, nor one, nor half a ducat, no, nor a mortigo, sixpence it will cost you, or six hundred pound. Expect no lower price, for by the banner of my front, I will not bait a bagatine, that I will have only a pledge of your loves, to carry something from amongst you, to show I am not contemned by you. Therefore now, toss your handkerchiefs, Cheerfully, cheerfully, and be advertised that the first heroic spirit that deigns to grace me with a handkerchief, I will give it a little remembrance of something. Besides, shall please it better than if I had presented it with a double pistolet. Will you be that heroic spark, Sir Paul? Celia, up at a window, throws down her handkerchief. Oh, see, the window has prevented you. Lady, I kiss your bounty, and for this timely grace you have done your poor Scotto of Mantua, I will return you, over and above my oil, a secret of that high and inestimable nature, shall make you forever enamoured on that minute, wherein your eye first descended on so mean, yet not altogether, to be despised, an object here is a powder concealed in the paper, of which, if I should speak to the worth, 9,000 volumes were but one page, that page as a line, that line as a word. So short is this pilgrimage of man, which some call life to the expressing of it. Would I reflect on the price? Why, the whole world is but as an empire, that empire as a province, that province as a bank, that bank as a private purse to the purchase of it. I will only tell you it is the powder that made Venus a goddess, given her by Apollo, that kept her perpetually young, cleared her wrinkles, firmed her gums, filled her skin, colored her hair from her, derived to Helen, and at the sack of Troy, unfortunately lost till now. In this <laughs> our age, it was happily recovered by a studious antiquary out of some ruins of Asia, who sent a moiety of it to the court of France, but much sophisticated, wherewith the ladies there now color their hair. The rest of this present remains with me, extracted to a quintessence, so that where it but touches, in youth it perpetually preserves, in age restores the complexion. Seats your teeth. Did they dance like virginal jacks, firm as a wall? Makes them white as ivory that were black as... Unfortunately, Act 2, Scene 3, enter Corvino and they are not impressed. My to the devil and my shame. Come down here. Come down. No house but mine to make your scene. Signor Flamino, will you down, sir? Down! What? My wife, your Francina, sir? Windows on the whole plot, piazza here, to make your properties, but mine, but mine. And Volpone, etc., all beaten away in this display of unhappiness. <laughs> ah, dear. Here tomorrow I shall be new christened, and be called the Pantaloni de Bessoni. 
back to town. What should this mean, Sir Paul? Some trick of state, believe it, I will home. It may be some design on you. I know not. I'll stand upon my guard. It is your best, sir. It's three weeks. All my places, all my letters have been intercepted. Indeed, sir. Best have a care. Nay, so I will. This night I may not lose him for my mirth till night. And they exit. We're going straight into Act 2, Scene 4, Enter Volpone and Mosca. Oh, I am wounded. Where, sir? Not without. Those blows were nothing. I could bear them, ever. But angry Cupid, bolting from her eyes, hath shot himself into me like a flame, where now he flings about his burning heat as in a furnace, an ambitious fire whose vent is stopped. The fight is all within me, I cannot live except thou help me, Mosca. My liver melts, and I, without the hope of some soft air from her refreshing breath, am but a heap of cinders. Alas, good sir, would you had never seen her? Nay, would thou hadst never told me of her? Mm, sir, it is true. I do confess I was unfortunate, and you unhappy. But I'm bound in conscience, no less than duty, to effect my best to your release of torment, and I will, sir. Dear Mosca, shall I hope? Sir, more than dear, I will not bid you to despair of aught within a human compass. Oh, there spoke my better angel. Mosca, take my keys, gold, plate, and jewels, all's at thy devotion. Employ them how you wilt. Nay, coin me too, so thou in this but crown my longings, Mosca. Use but your patience. So I have. I doubt not to bring success to your desires. Nay then, I not repent me of my late disguise. If you can horn him, sir, you need not. <laughs> Besides, I never meant him for my heir. Is not the colour of my beard and eyebrows to make me known? No, Jot. I did it well? So well would I could follow you in mine with half the happiness. And yet I would escape your epilogue. But were they gulled with a belief that I was Scotto? Oh, sir, Scotto himself could hardly have distinguished. I have not time to flatter you now. We'll part. And as I prosper, so applaud my arts. And there we will pause. Uh, so that's quite a chore de force again. I mean... In, in in practice, there's a lot of trimming to be done there. Um, I mean, it's all good stuff, but there's a lot of good stuff. We've had this this with Johnson's comedy before. Uh, all of the options of comedy uh, business is there, and this is you know this is well worn comedy business as well. We've got this kind of material going back, you know, better part of hundred years, um, of you know peddlers and mountebanks selling their wares, uh, selling their relics, uh, selling things. But it's all very, very well put together. There's some really nice turn I won't sell it you for this. I won't even sell it you for this. I mean this is this is pattern we still have today. Um and and we still have this kind of life. I mean I love the fact that they we've got Nano uh, um uh, apparently accompanied by Mosca. Um singing songs as well so he's got a jingle um you know it's it's, it's a proper pucker advert for his wares um and you know again uh, uh what was a thing you you, uh, uh, you know because the, the these kind of mountain banks and sellers will be selling all sorts of wares as well and uh, some of them would be you know ballads and music and and, and and stuff and would be there to sell as well as uh, as well as the other merchandise that they're selling uh thoughts on the room uh alan I must admit that that sequence took me straight back to one occasion. I think it was probably in the late 1960s when I actually visited Petticoat Lane Market. You know, and they were still doing the same shtick. Mm. You know, um, and you know all the stuff of you know uh, this 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 is the same stuff as uh, Helen of Troy. You know. Uh, <laughs> Once lost, but now found. Yeah, and we know we've we found the secret. It's it's all uh, straight from straight from Eleanor Troy's face, uh, Aliki. 
I swear I've seen that advertised on Instagram. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, um, and it does all the things, um, uh, you know, sets your, te sets your teeth. Um, um, I, I did particularly like the fact that the song uh, uh, basically is advertising, it, one of its effects is Viagra. Um, uh, <laughs> you know, you can tell who the, who the people uh, he's advertising this to is as well. <laughs> well, um, you had Colchester Oysters in there as well, so... Uh... Mm. An alleged aphrodisiac. Mm. Um, I mean, I, 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 again, there's a lot of text there. I mean, it's absolutely massive. Uh, I, I, you know, uh, I, I wouldn't want to learn it, let alone uh, necessarily sit through all of it. Um, but you can pick and choose your battles on that one. Mm. I think that's what that's, again, it's, it's, it's never really a problem when you've got so much good material. It's just, uh, I mean, it's always a shame to throw some of it out. But when it's, um, but, you know, that, that's fine. That's fine. Uh, other thoughts about this? Uh, obviously, we've got the sort of Politic and Peregrine commentating on it throughout as well mm. to break it up, to give Volponi an in-breath. Because um, <laughs> otherwise, Volponi... And that's also, I suppose, what the songs are for as well, mm. uh, is to, to do little uh, um, uh, moments to, uh, to, uh, uh, to, to breathe. Um, but it's it's also moving the plot on, of course. Uh, you know, the whole appeal. I don't want your money. I just want your handkerchief, fair lady up watching from the balcony. Thank you very much. Um, who is the so one of the reasons why you're there. Um, and, of course, in the little scene that follows, you know, oh, you're wounded to the heart. Oh, poor you. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, I'm sure that will go well. <laughs> Uh, I mean, Aliki. It's nice to see him not gloating for once. Mm. You know, we've we've only seen him for an act and a half, but already you're you're a bit sick of him being so very pleased with himself. <laughs> mm. Yeah. yeah. Um yeah, and, and but he also gives Mosca a, a slightly different uh direction to go as well. Uh Sarah. Yeah, I think um it it's it would be interesting in the rehearsal room with this to find the point at which he sees her um because of course that this whole setup is is i mean yeah he's not he's not really this isn't about fleecing anyone really i mean it's it's hilarious isn't it because he, he spends all his time usually or up until this point doing this kind of very over the top but quite naturalistic in inverted commas um con to to get people out of money and here he's actually you know pretending to be a mountieback supposedly to get people's money but it doesn't the money is not what he wants what he wants is to see her and so i think it would be really interesting that that moment to find that moment where you know whether it's I, I you'd want to maybe leave it until the moment where she 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 drops the handkerchief but where he sees her and the effect that that has on her and the effect that that then has on the rest of his speech which is why you kind of want to save it for quite near the end because you could have some real fun um with the end of that speech because up until that point he's been completely in charge and he's been the showman and he's been working the crowd but then as Aliki says it's really it's really fun to see him come unstuck and I think this would be a good p place where you could have him suddenly like oh blah blah well you know and he starts stuttering and he I don't know whatever he's standing on he maybe falls off or whatever and and, he, and it's like but he's got to finish the stick the shtick he's got to he's got to get through to the end of it but he's like Oh, and and that would just be something that um, I, I think could be great fun to work with in the rehearsal room, but also really good for the audience to to just to see the effects of him and to see him like yeah be a bit more fallible and be a bit more um, yeah not always the, the smartest guy in the room. Mm. Mm -hmm. And you know, on a structural level as well, we mentioned you know uh, the misleading title of uh, Volpone from Act One. You know, Volpone doesn't say a lot. Well, there's a there's a counterbalance here. Mosca doesn't say a lot in this in this most of this act. There is still more more of Act Two to go. Um, but yeah, you can you can see that this is the point where Volpone needs to really kick the the, the brain into gear um, and gets you know because he spent Act One lying on a couch going. Uh, act two, you've got to jump about and and talk incessantly, um, and and yeah, lots of lots of little flowy things. Uh, any other thoughts about Act 
two uh we basically went through um you know we we had that scene with sir politic and uh peregrine sort of so that they're there in the background during this scene they're not really active in the plot yet but they help break up that scene uh and of course we have um the the very unhappy uh corvino popping in um being the breaking everything up and i'm i'm sure that, frankly the actor volpone is quite delighted that he turns up on cue because uh if he doesn't turn up on cue uh what do you do <laughs> where do you go thank you very much and good night um okay we'll go round uh for final thoughts then a leaky um uh volpone so far we're about a third of the way through the play any final thoughts I don't really know that I've got a lot to add. There, there is certainly an awful lot of it. I, I love the idea of seeing an actual emotion from him. I've just been looking at that last bit of the, of the speech, trying to find where that is. And I think it's actually fairly straightforward in the text. I think he says it straight out. Anyway, um, it, it's fun. It's enormous fun. Um, I, I really like all of the characters and uh, looking forward to seeing more of this. Mm. Uh, uh, Alan, any final thoughts? Yeah, I mean, uh, I think, as you say, we've done about 10,000 words, which is a fair old troll through. And the problem is working out which bits you can actually cut without losing an all, some some of the good bits, because there are an awful lot of good lines in there. Yeah, but the audience don't know if they've missed a good bit because they're not watching it. Uh, <laughs> all, the, all that we need to do is decide which good bits we want to keep. Uh, yeah, um, I mean, there is. I, I have to say, there, there's, there's part of me sort of going, "Oh, so Peregrine, uh, Peregrine and Sir Politic, maybe, maybe they get a, a raw deal here." Um, because how much of them do we really enjoy in the same way as everything else? Um, but then, how important are they to the plot? I don't really know yet. Um, in terms of the structure of it all, are they there just to break up the flow, or are they going to actually actively do something? Uh, we shall see. Uh, any other thoughts, Alan? Sorry, I sort of jumped well, we, in Well, we've also got the character who's been mentioned, which is Lady Politic. Mm. Um, and I must admit, Reef reading uh, some of Politic's bits earlier on, you always get the impression that he's fairly firmly under the thumb. She's decided she wants to go to Venice. Uh, so he didn't really get a choice in the matter. Hmm. We shall see what we shall see. They, the, the, uh, uh, the, the uh, lady would be uh, does appear later on, so we will we will find out a bit about them. Uh, we might even find out a little about um, uh, about Celia, who uh, has, has you know has has dropped a handkerchief, but so far has not said anything. Um, but there there may be an interesting doubling question as to uh, certain movements of peoples, um, uh, in the sense that we 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 see Nano, but we don't see. Uh, 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 and, uh, androgyno. Uh, so I'm just wondering if that's a logical doubling uh, within the logic of the text. Uh, Sarah, any final thoughts? Uh, I'm just really enjoying it. Um, yeah, I mean, it does. It does. It would need cutting for a for a contemporary performance. But like, I I don't think it would be a problem. I mean, you just need someone who's good at cutting texts. And frankly, you know, we have we have our we have our um, dear leader here who's, you know, I, I I really don't think this is not, this is not a problematic text. I mean, it has, it has moments, it has, it has other problems in it, but in terms of actually cutting it and working out what you would cut out and what you would leave in, it's not a problematic text. So yeah, and I think it would just fly. Um, and, you know, maybe, Maybe I'm giving away too much of myself here because maybe not everyone does, but my attitude is everyone loves a con. Everyone loves a really clever con. They like to see how it they like to see how it works out. Um, they like to see, you know, as long as they are stupid or selfish or in this case avaricious people get con, they they like watching it unfold. And I think um I yeah. I, I'm, I'm just really looking forward. I'm just wondering, I, I, I have read this play, but it was many, many years ago and I don't really remember. I'm just wondering if Sir Peregrine and, um, uh, no, sorry, Sir Politic and, and Peregrine, if you if you did cut them right down, um, could you double the actors with, with one of the crows? Um, 
the, or, the prob- or do the, they all appear in the in the same scene in the same scene later on? Well, that's an interesting structural question, which I think we'll we'll get to. I think you could make some of that doubling work, is in the sense that people could sort of come in and out. There, there are scenes mm. later on where a lot of people are all on stage at the same time, hypothetically. But whether they actually talk to each other is a mm. slightly different matter. It, it's, it's, I have seen this with a relatively small cast, um, and it's it's like you know the the sort of obvious potential cuts there, which is you know the the, the the, the mini mask that randomly is presented to Volpone at the beginning. Do you know? Do we need that beyond the the, the questions of representation and what that that scene is saying? Um, it doesn't actually add anything to the dramaturgy particularly. It, it sort of gets in the way of plot because it's mm. it's sort of this little divertissement, um, but it doesn't necessarily advance anything so so there's sort of big chunks like that where an entire scene almost could, could disappear um and then i say there's the whole mountebank sequence which which you know there are, are far too many words um and you basically need to not even by half i mean i'm thinking almost two-thirds of that is gone yeah um because it's the pat it's the sense of the patter and the sense and some of the better jokes but you don't actually need nearly any of it because what you, you want to do is get to the handkerchief Mm-hmm. Um, uh, though, as I say, you don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater, so there's some negotiation there. But you know, you could have one of the songs. So the, the second non- nano song is quite good in that sequence. The first one wasn't so exciting uh, for me, anyway. Um, uh, so I do, do need two songs when you could have one. Um, so there's lots of options there. I mean, it's 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 what twenty nine, um, a better part of twenty nine thousand words, um, thirty uh, ish um, uh, in terms of the actual play text uh which is you know a good ten thousand more than you really want um practically you can do a, a longer version but you know it it's it, it's epically long um so it, it does need a good third of it taken out uh and that's a lot of words um but a lot of words that are quite potentially cuttable uh, i'll go to alan then sarah and then i'll go to lynn's final thoughts yeah i'm just wondering whether the purpose of the uh the mask at the beginning with the uh, questionable servants is actually to give um, the two lead actors a chance to actually recover their breath. Um, not really. They've only had a, not even ninety lines between them before that. Mm. Um, they they haven't been on for very long at that moment. Um, they're, they're barely gearing up, and one of them's about to have a nap for half an hour anyway. Um, <laughs> Sarah. <laughs> uh, yeah, I I think with that mask. Um, what I'd be tempted to do with it is um, move it to when the, while the audience are coming in, um, so that it's like it's just you know the the the, the, the they come on stage and do it uh, to kind of set the scene, um, and and get the audience into into the into the vibe of of of, of the play because it it is so it's a great little I mean come on Ben Johnson this is what he did. <laughs> You know, so it's like I'm sure I don't know why he decided to shove one in there, but it's like, well, you know, he's he's really good at this, and he does this perfect little mini one here, and so uh, it would be a shame to lose it altogether. But so I think you could kind of have it just going on, um, you know, before the action starts um, for those members of audience who always insist on turning up, you know, twenty minutes early. Um, it, it it would be quite fun. Uh, to have it just sort of going on in the background and as more and more people come in it could get bigger and bigger um but the other thing i was just going to quickly say um sorry lynn um it w- was just even though this is yeah you know probably ten thousand words too long if it needs to be cut by a third we've still managed to do it in our regular time slot we've done a, a lot more words than we normally do but it is it does move really fast so and bearing in mind that this is a cold read as well. But we haven't um, really stopped and discussed it very much. And there no, are, that's, and that's also true. the amount of that's discussion true. we've done, we, even when we discuss, is much less because there's fewer people in the room. Um, that's true. So, that's true. So that does make a difference. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it doesn't, okay, it's, it's not a slow moving text by any stretch of the imagination, but it's still, there's still too many words. Um, but hey, that's, that's more for a second look question. Heaven help us all! Uh, how long that one's going to be? Um, that 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 the the there there are so the lumber support is it only does so much of a job for a, a play of this length. Um, uh, Lynn, any final thoughts? 
Yeah, um, <clears throat> I, I am familiar with this play, and I, but I, I <laughs> haven't read it in a while, so I kind of know the answers to the questions that are that it, the, the text is raising. Mm. I mean, the the but the plotting and the structure are really good. You you get this hint that things are going to start to go not in Volpone's direction anymore. Like Sarah says, he's in charge, he's in control, he's he's stage managing everything until desire rears its ugly head um I mean, he doesn't say i've got to have their money i've got to have their money i've got to have all their stuff i'll just die without it you know he's just like oh, i'm gonna get their stuff and he does it um but he sees a woman he desires and he's wounded you know it's a different game and it's not he's not don juan he's not the vicomte de velmont he's Volpone. He's not good at this. Um, so you, you kind of wonder, is it, and she's another man's wife. She is not available to him. Um, so like, is he going to learn something about himself and his place in the world uh, um, in his pursuit of this, this woman? And I, is this going to, is this going to be different? Is, is the world going to change for him? Um um, and that's, you know, that's how a comedy works. That's why, how a narrative w- works. It, it raises these questions somehow where in the back of our minds about a third of the way through. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, I mean, structurally, it's just, it's so, it's so well done. Uh, and, you know, at this point, you know, Volpone is, he's so good at what he does. He's so smart. Um, um, but, but yeah, you don't, you don't dislike him I and all his marks are people you like even less. So, uh, so yeah, and everyone loves a, a good con, whether the con man is someone you'd want to be friends with or not. So, yeah, I mean, it's, it's problematic in that it's so expansive. Uh, it, the audiences these days are not prepared for that, but the skeleton of the, of the plotting of the structure is so good. Mm. Uh, yes, and I, I'm sure, and well done for not doing any spoilers there, because it's very tempting, isn't it? Um, yeah. Because the, the, there are things to discuss uh, as we go along, uh, but uh, that we'll do them as we reach them. Uh, so, uh, any additional thoughts in the room? Otherwise, I will close the session now. So, all that remains, thank all the wonderful readers for all their wonderful reading. Thank you very much, everyone, and goodbye, shriveled salad-eating artisans. <laughs> <laughs>